It's my very great pleasure to uh, uh, chair this session this morning uh, with uh, our wonderful keynote, Professor Celia Lurie, uh, who is a professor and a founding director of the Center of Interdisciplinary Methodologies in Warwick University in UK. Uh, Professor Lurie is well considered as one of the most original social thinkers and theorists in the area of the interdisciplinary study of culture and uh, life methodologies and the ways in which they contribute to the enactment of social worlds. With Sophie Day and Helen Ward, Professor Lurie has just started a welcome trust-funded project called People Like You, Contemporary Figures of Personalization. And the aim of the project is to assess whether and how personalizing practices are influencing taken for granted concepts of the person. Her uh, recent publications include the Handbook of Interdisciplinary Methods, which is, which, uh, is co-edited uh, with uh, Fernstam, Lamas and Helen Nicholas, uh, and last Michael, and uh, Abir Chad. Did it go right? The names are, yeah, yeah. yeah. Something sort like of. that. <laughs> oh, anyway, Routledge 2018. And the title of, uh, of Professor Lurie's talk is People Like You, Shifters as Figures of Speech. Please join me in welcoming Professor Lurie. The screen is yours. So. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. I want to say how sorry I am not to be there in person. I was so pleased to get the invitation and I'm very disappointed not to be there with you. I've been following it as well as I can um, with the, the streaming of the talks that have been given um, and that's only made me sadder that I couldn't be with you but unfortunately it was a sudden um, health issue that came up and um, so here I am, my screen, my slide. Um, as Jan has just said, uh, I'm currently working on a project on personalization, which has the title People Like You, Contemporary Figures of Personalization, funded by the Wellcome Trust. And one of the characteristics of personalization as we are understanding it is that it always involves participation of some kind, which is why I thought it would be so interesting to speak here and to hear the other papers. The co-eyes on the project are Sophie Day and Helen Ward. Uh, we have research fellows Fiona Johnston, Ross Red, Will Viney and Scott Walk. And this is the landing page of our website. Uh, can you just check, is there bad feedback when I speak? No. No, okay, I can hear it, but if you can't, that's fine for me. <laughs> okay, so what I want to do just to start is to give you an everyday example of personalization involving uh, participation. A couple of months ago, uh, my niece, whose name is Delilah, uh, posted a photograph of a drinks cup on Instagram. When I met her recently, I said I thought the image was a good example of personalization gone wrong or perverted. She replied that she has a friend who has a Starbucks name. That is a name she gives when asked for her name in a Starbucks outlet, not her real name. Another friend apparently says his name is My Drink, which my niece describes as being a bit mean. I give my name, but I spell it from a vague sense of sympathy with the person requesting the name, but probably just introducing an unwanted teaching or surveillance dynamic to the interaction. My niece says that she enjoys seeing the misspellings of her name. A friend of mine says that she gives the name of the person asking her. I just managed to stop myself doing this the other day when I was asked for my name. The woman who asked wasn't wearing a name badge, but an apron with the restaurant chain name on it, Giraffe. In a different food chain, 
My daughter says that the customers are required to give orders via an iPad and are automatically given a name. Hers was Lady Gaga. She says she would have preferred to be given a number, which she sees as more anonymous, while allowing her and others to know they'll be served in the sequence in which they place their orders. So I start with this everyday example to foreground what we all know that naming is socially significant as a mechanism of identification of someone as an individual, and that as such, it's routinely subverted. That is, uh, our participation in naming uh, can involve misrepresentation, subterfuge, and impersonation. There are many other points of interest in this example. The use of first names alone, the asymmetries involved in the use of names by employees and customers, the subsumption of personal names by company names, the limited opportunities for expressions of solidarity, the alternative op opportunities provided by numbering, and so on. In the rest of the paper, I'm going to focus on other examples. My examples will be not in our name, and the hashtags Jusui Shali and Me Too. And I'm going to use these examples to suggest that as we participate in personalizing practices, we compose or are composed as figures of speech or what I will call individuals. I can see the slides are a little way behind me. I must remember that. Okay, the term individual is introduced and developed by uh, Marco Desiris. He says it's a derivative of the Italian word condivisione, dividing together. For me, a powerful way of visualizing dividing together is provided by the artwork by the artist Mel Bockner called theory of boundaries, and this artwork employs what Bill Bockner calls language fractions. And you'll see on the right of the slide, I've given a description by someone explaining uh, these language fractions, or uh, providing Mel Bockner's own explanation of these language fractions, where he says the first term refers to the tangential relationship of the film, colour in this case, and the border. And I want to pick up there, a couple of the papers yesterday talked about the border. And I think obviously we can talk about the border of an artwork, but we can also talk about the border of a country. The second term refers to its position, that's the film and colour, as regards the sense of enclosure. Enclosure considered as condition of position. So dividing together uh, the issues that this raises for me are issues of the border, the operation of the border, of inclusion and exclusion, and of enclosure as a condition of position, of belonging as a condition of position. So these language fractions, participating in, over, being part of, in, over, of, what kind of individual dividing together is involved in our participation in personalizing practices? So, my analysis is going to take those three examples I mentioned. They involve the use of names, numbers, and pronouns. And I want to suggest they combine individualizing and individualizing relations to produce figures of speech or individuals. And I'm just going to flag out now the four interrelated concerns that I have. I'm concerned with how individuals are composed as simultaneously singular and plural. And this about a focus on what Jazirius calls a double operation, which is both selective and extensive, individuating and massifying. I am, of course, also interested in the role of participation, 
And I make a distinction between participating in and being part of. As this symposium recognizes, we're increasingly invited to participate in a variety of genres of participation, including tests, trials, games, competitions, experiments, quizzes, and so on, often linked to various forms of tracking and tracing, where we're not so much participating as being participated. In the personalization project, we propose that participation in some form or other, is the mechanism by which I would like, like, as resemblance, as resemblance similarity. similarity. Celia, we have some uh, problems with the sound. I think we have to fix that. Okay. So if you can stop for a moment. I'm very sorry. Uh, so, <laughs> who can help me with this problem? Andrew or... Uh, I can pretend to yeah. help. Yeah. Uh, I think it... My you suspicion... Is it's uh, just a, a internet relay problem, and it might just be waiting a few seconds and then trying okay. again. This would be my first strategy. If but if, uh, if any of the yes, I'm getting nodding heads from people who know this system better. It might be that just if like she if Celia repeats the last sentence. Yeah. Yeah, if you can repeat the last sentence and we'll, yeah, okay. it was only a kind of a temporary problem. Yes. And thank you. Okay, you can hear me now. Yeah, yes? yeah, yeah now we can oh. hear you well. Thank you for your patience. Yeah, oh no, I apologize. So I'm talking about the importance of participation and saying that in the personalization project, we're proposing that participation is the mechanism by which like as resemblance or similarity with others, and like as preference, as liking, are brought together. So people like you, similar to you, like, prefer things like, similar to this. So we have a sequencing of likeness as resemblance, similarity, and like as liking as preference, and they're brought into a sequence in a process of participation where we say whether we like or not, whatever it is, and that this creates a pathway of individuation of persons that are simultaneously uh, singular and plural. You, in English, is both singular and plural. A third concern is whether and how the individuals I describe might be understood as proper or improper persons. And proper is used here to reference property in the self, propriety, the proprietary, appropriation, and appropriateness. And I'm drawing here on the work of Deserto and Borgia, who developed these understandings of the proper in relation to the ability to circumscribe place. And in the paper, what I hope to show is how place is getting circumscribed in new ways, and that I link that to the recursive mechanisms of participation and consider how those mechanisms inform our understandings of proper and improper persons. My final concern is epistemological. That is, I'm concerned with whether and how the individuals I describe, these figures of speech, can speak the truth. Okay, so you can tell from that summary, it's quite a complex paper, uh, but what I'm going to do first of all is introduce uh, the understandings of pronouns that I'm going to use as part of the analysis. And I... Forgive me, I think you're all much more skilled in this. My understanding is a bit rudimentary, but I'm going to say what I, the understandings I use. First one, uh, the classical nature of pronouns, Emil Benveniste, he, and he addresses the special characteristics of personal pronouns by observing that they refer to a different subject or object each time they're used. He further suggests that only I and you 
first and second person pronouns can really be described as personal pronouns in that only they call into existence a unique subject. He says, each I has its own reference and corresponds each time to a unique being who is set up as such. Then the beast further observes that the referential relationship uh, the personal pronoun I creates is a circular one. It refers to something when it's used, and what it then refers to is this use itself. That is, the speaker's self-reference and the referentiality of the message are interlinked. He says, the establishment of subjectivity in language creates the category of the person, both in language and also, we believe, outside of it as well. Taking up and revising, revising Ben the Beast, uh, the psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan and others identify what is described as a splitting or a doubling between the subject of the enunciation and the subject of the statement, exploring the implications of this splitting or doubling for subjectivity and for political agency. In another strand of thinking, also drawing on these, Roman Jacobson describes personal pronouns as shifters. Unlike Ben Beneast, he's not concerned with the subject as such, but instead with the speaker. The focus of his analysis is not the first person singular, but the first person plural. And of special interest, perhaps, to us here may be the way in which Jacobson's understanding of personal pronouns makes use of information theory, including his introduction of two general distinctions, one between language and that which it narrates, and one between an event and its participants. Four items, he says, are to be distinguished, a narrated event, a speech event, a participant of the narrated event, and a participant of the speech event, whether addresser or addressee. I'm going to draw on those understandings in my discussion of these three examples. But first of all, I'm going to just say a bit about each of the examples. The first one, not in our name, is a slogan with a long history, but its recent usage includes the name of an organization, not in our name. This was a United States organization founded in March 23, 2002 to protest the US government's response to the events of September 11, 2001. Its statement of conscience calls on the people of the US to resist the policies and overall political direction that have emerged since September 11, 2001 and which pose, this is a quote, and which pose great dangers to the people of the world. The organization was formally disbanded in uh, March 31st, 2008. The phrase, not in my name, not in our name, was adopted as a slogan as part of public demonstrations in cities across the UK against the involvement of the UK government in the war against Iraq in 2003. Google search provides uh, more recent examples of other uses, including uh, Not In My Name uh, as a slogan by a British Muslim organization, the Active Change Foundation, and the same slogan is also being used in religious and political protests relating to the slaughter of cows in India. My second example is the hashtag Je suis Charlie, which emerged on Twitter in 2015 following the attack on 7th of January by gunmen at the offices of the French satirical magazine Charlie Hebdo. Two days after the event, the hashtag had been used over 5 million times on Twitter, making it one of the most popular topics in the platform's history. Most uses of these initially French language hashtags were not from French accounts. Immediately following the appearance of this hashtag, another appeared. Je ne suis pas Charlie, although in smaller numbers. Others followed, including hashtag Je suis Arnaud. 
Later that year, Willem, one of the cartoonists employed at the magazine, declared, we bonnet on those who suddenly declared that they were our friends. So that, that's my second example. My third example is uh, the hashtag MeToo. Uh, the MeToo movement, as you're probably well aware, is a movement against sexual harassment and assault. Tarana Burke, an American social activist and community organizer, began using the phrase MeToo to refer to sexual harassment in 2006, but the hashtag MeToo spread virally in October 2017 following sexual misconduct allegations against Harvey Weinstein. The hashtag was tweeted by the American Connector Elisa Milano around noon on October the 15th, 2017, and had been used more than 200,000 times by the end of the day, and tweeted more than 500,000 times by the next day. On Facebook, the hashtag was used by more than 4.7 million people in 12 million posts during the first 24 hours. The platform reported that 45% of users of Facebook in the United States had a friend who had posted using the term. So that's just a very brief account of my three examples. And I'm now going to go on to develop my analysis. In the first example, not in your name, the possibilities for shifting afforded by pronouns are muted by the containment of the pronoun in a name, the name of the organization. So that in this use, the name symbolically individuates, names a collective entity. This collective entity comprises individuals whose individual membership is indicated by their signatures, a conventional use of names to indicate a unique individual whose persistent existence or coincidence of the self across time and space, independent of context, is legally recognized. The thinking of speech that is composed in this use of a pronoun as part of a name is thus a properly circumscribed collective entity comprised of many unique eyes, proper individual persons. However, while its capacity to be a shifter is restricted, attention to the use of the pronoun our in the name not in our name encourages us to see that the circular logic of identification that is involved in the use of names relies upon a short circuiting. It is the political and legal authority of the state, including the apparatus of naming, including the registers of birth, marriage and death, as well as laws of forgery and impersonation that allow means to be used as legitimate identifiers of individuals and organizations. It's the state apparatus that gives properness to this figure of speech addressed to the government. However, when the, name, when the words not in our name or not in my name are not used as names, that appear on placards carried by someone at a demonstration, the specific person or persons to which my or our refers shifts while relying on the symbolic convention that the person holding the placard agrees with the meaning of the statement on the placard, the subject who speaks is not given a unique fixed identity and is not accorded a prior and future existence as an individual. That is, when not in my name is inscribed on a placard that moves from one person to another and no name is given, the personal pronoun refers or references one individual among other individuals and not quite proper pers persons. People, when they carry the placard, are individuated, but they are identified not in their uniqueness, but in equivalence or sameness. As the placard moves from person to person, my not in my name has the same standing as your not in my name. In short, the meaning of the words on the placard doesn't 
identify you or me as a unique, context-independent individual, but indicates us as an individual member of a collective of one among other ones. And while we might be able to infer that one of the intended addressees is the government, perhaps because of the root of the march, we can also infer that the individual indicated is also addressing other individuals who by their co-presence can point to and be pointed out to each other, making a shared context through a reciprocal pointing out is one of the ways in which the solidarity of this figure of speech is given substance, even if it may lose form, if it, or when it becomes a crowd. In the case of the hashtag Charlie, the use of a name does not contain the pronoun. While Shali is capitalized as a proper name, it's not functioning properly. The Charlie of I am Charlie, we may infer, if we are aware of the events of the attack, is a shortening of the magazine name. However, as the hashtag is used again and again, as the number of speech events aggregates, we may also infer that the I that speaks is not the subject of the narrated event. Indeed, that the hashtag user who says I am Charlie is not to be identified as a member of Charlie Hebdo, the magazine, is so I stroke we gather as I stroke we divide together. This is the point of this pointing, that we are not a member of Charlie Hebdo. And as we gather, we are not surprised to find that the impropriety of this speech act, to claim we are Charlie when we are not, elicits a critical response from others. As mentioned earlier, Willem the cartoonist, contributor to the magazine, explicitly rejected the identification made by others. He says he wants on them. Others asserted, je ne suis pas Charlie. We can see Willem's response following Ben Beniste as an assertion by Byrne, the shadow of his experience of an attack on his life and that of his colleagues, of the impropriety of anyone else asserting any kind of existential link to the event. Or, following Jacobson, we can see it as a denial of the right of others to participate in the narrated event through participation in the speech event. In contrast, those who responded to the use of the hashtag Je suis Charlie by using the hashtag Je ne suis pas Charlie can be seen to be supporting the right of others to participate in the narrated event by exercising the ability to participate in the speech event themselves, even as they refuse to identify with Charlie. As you're no doubt aware, both the hashtag Shisui Shani and the hashtag Shisui Parshali circulate in a digital infrastructure in which addresses and addressees stand in complex relations to each other. In both instances, the addresses are typically Twitter, Facebook, or other social media accounts. In both instances, the addressees include the followers of the account holder who posts the claims. Some of these addresses will be known in some other way to the addresses or account holders, but some will not. Some will be what we might call subjects or natural persons. Some will not. That is, they will be bots or Russian trolls. Some addressees will become addressers. Some will not. And not following back is possible, but is not to be presumed. In other words, there's the potential for multiple possible confusions, tangles, and confrontations in the circular sequencing of self-referencing that's put in process in these social media platforms. Indeed, we might suggest 
suggests that what emerges is a individual that is internally conflicted. That this individual is a contestation of whether you can participate in an event without being a part of it. And as a continually forking sequencing, it provides an example of what Bateson, Gregory Bateson, calls ismogenesis, the continual reproduction, confirmation, and intensification of difference. Bateson developed this term, schismogenesis, in his analysis of double binds or double takes, which in turn he describes as the primary example of transcontextualism, a genus of syndromes or cognitive tangles that arise when individuals learn or fail to learn how to deal with uncertainty in relation to context. And I see this point in my paper also referring back very strongly to the discussions yesterday. At the heart of this genus of cognitive tangle, says Bateson, is the human capacity to deal with the weaving of contexts and of messages which propose context, but which, like all messages whatsoever, have meaning only by virtue of context. Context may set the stage for a certain class of response, but learning what changes and what stays the same across contexts is challenging and reaches in the weave of contextual structure common. That was Bateson. The digital infrastructure I described briefly above with the multiple possibilities of non-coincidence of time and space of participation in speech and narrated events seems designed to provoke such breaches, turning twists into tangles, sometimes even knots. So, turning now to my third example, the case of the hashtag uh, MeToo, I need to acknowledge that I took the description of the movement from Wikipedia. I also want to know but the first paragraph of the entry for this ends with the sentence, for all public cases of the Me Too movement, the presumption of innocence applies until a final conviction. Like the case of Shusui Shari, this example demonstrates that disbelief, doubt, and speculation are the unavoidable outcome of the serial calibration of signal and noise inference and interference, certainty and uncertainty across contexts, and this characteristic of communication in digital media. However, as well as triggering other claims, not me to, him to, me neither, some of the speakers in the movement are engaged in a series of trials, legal and otherwise, in which the relation of personal pronouns to subjects who can be, and sometimes are named, is what matters. In these contexts, the question becomes, is the me telling the truth about the named person? In short, the example highlights the challenges facing a non-symbolic or non-representational politics of pronouns the kinds of relations that can be established between the singular and the plural, and the challenges such a politics poses for understandings of proper and improper persons, as well as raising questions about how we establish truth. In this regard, it's worth pointing out pronoun in this case, it's not I, but me, that is the first person object pronoun, and as such the receiver of the action of the verb, and can, significantly from my point of view, be the object of a preposition, such as with. And of course, in this case, me is conjoined with to, to make a compound composite term, making it visible that a link to someone, some others, is constitutive of this figure of speech, of this individual, as 
a simultaneously singular and plural figure of speech. And here, I want to suggest that it's not necessarily helpful to say that these figures of speech, the hashtag me too, participates in an era of post-truth, or to say that truth is now after the fact. According to Ben Beniste, uh, as self-referential and empty signs, pronouns can't be used incorrectly. He says as they don't state anything, they are not subject to the conditions of truth and escape denial. This is not, I think, Jacobson's view, as becomes apparent in his discussion of the third person plural of we, which he describes as both a shifter and a non-shifter. In his view, we is a non-shifter insofar as it conveys information as to category of person, specifically gender, and category of number. Indeed, as Julie Kersel in a really illuminating commentary points out, this leads Jacobson to acknowledge that there is considerable potential for uncertainty as to who we might be. She says, who this pronoun includes, whether it refers to the speaker and the listener, to the speaker as participant, along with further participants of the event described, whether it describes others present but excludes the addressee, or the other way round, or whether it refers to a group of individuals all speaking simultaneously, is unclear. As we know, the information conveyed by gender varies significantly across languages. One point of interest in current uses of English language is the displacement of information relating to category of person, gender, onto category of number through the advocacy of the use of the third person plural, they, their. And of course, there's lots more that could be said about this. But for now, I want to focus on the category of number and in relation to me too, to suggest that the kind of number called into existence here is a digital, computational, or distributive number. And I use this term, distributive number, uh, as it's introduced and developed by Adrian McKenzie. And he uses this um, in addition of statistics. So he suggests that distributed numbers uh, uh, from joint probability distributions calculated in complex statistical techniques such as MCNC, which is Markov Chain Monte Carlo. The value of such numbers, he says, is that they don't presume, as do many understandings of probability, that events are independent or that they are identically distributed, as do many mainstream statistical techniques. Instead, they, these techniques allow that all numbers, all events, are probability distributions. In techniques such as NCNC, Mackenzie further notes, the lines between objective and subjective, or aleatory and epistemic probability, begin to shift towards a refolding of probability through world and experience. And it's for this reason he talks of the emergence of a truth of variation in statistical analysis. I want to put forward the suggestion that the individual, the hashtag me too, is another kind of distributive number. Uh, that is, or that are, proving to have the capacity to trouble the location of truth in the speaking subject, to trouble the location of truth in I, and his, her, their capacity to narrate. In the use of the hashtag me too, 
Truth is established in the conjoining of me with two, not through the addition of independent individual ones or the continuities of subject established in time and space by narrative, but through the circumscriptions of a dividing together that emerges from the use of algorithms, databases, and the dynamic aggregation of serial participation. V2 is a number, a vague whole, that can't be summed up by counting, despite the numbers, the counting numbers I gave above. So what I'm suggesting here is the we, the individual that is me too, is not defined by the operation of a distinction between a speech event and a, narrate, and a narrated event, but between speech and some other, perhaps mediated or distributive kind of event. And that in relation to this distinction, the circumscription of place or territory can't, or at least has not yet, being properly determined. The properness of this figure of speech, this individual me too, the trust we place in this new category of number and the circumscription of place or territory that can only be determined vaguely without reference to state is, I suggest, what's at stake in currently ongoing trials and uh, investigations. So, I'm now going to give you a, a rather brief um, conclusion to what I've been trying to argue here. I'm going to just make a few uh, concluding remarks. So, Desiree is, in his discussion of the individual and improper names, says that rather than expressing heterogeneity or homogeneity, difference or totality, the improper is a mode of mediation. And this mediation is evident not only in the passage from the one to the many and vice versa, but also in the relation between signifying and asignifying practices within the assemblage. The question then is how to understand this process of mediation. Elena Esposito provides one way when she draws attention to how the granular elements of a medium take on different forms in response to the relations created between them. As she puts it, in the medium of language, the elements are the single words that in the medium have no connection to one another and gain sense only in the context of the sentences coupling them tighter. If we adopt this view in relation to the examples I've discussed, the elements are the data points, the likes, shares, retweets, etc., which are in the medium-specific operations of search, sort, store, share, count, brought into multiple and dynamic relations with each other in the participative operations of specific platforms. So, this would be to suggest that an exploration of those relations is helpful and necessary. But to Esposito's understanding of the medium form distinction, I would add the concept of a pure middle that is to be found in the work of the critic Walter Benjamin, who proposes that a pure middle would be one whose middleness is not defined with respect to determinal endpoints, but is rather an infinite and infinitely divisible space. Of this space, of Walter Benjamin's pure middle, the critic Peter Benders writes, nothing can withstand this space intact. Infinite divisibility is the law of this space, which, however, cannot be posited as a law, since this division is never governed by an identifiable rule. The law of this space the rule by which its infinite divisibility is articulated must likewise be infinitely co-divisible. In German, mitalbar, which is to say communicable. The 
huge production of this abstraction of the pure middle into social life by way of media-specific operations of participation is precisely what has been of interest to me here. It allows me to suggest that we're not simply witnessing, participating in, being part of a proliferation of kinds of individuals, of proper and improper persons, but also that rather than being in the era of post-truth or after the fact, we are stuck in the middle with people like you. And if we are stuck in the middle with people like you, this requires that we divide together with both imagination and care, recognizing the rugged edges of inclusion and exclusion that emerge when we participate in, but are not necessarily part of the whole that emerges, recognizing that we do not necessarily know what we are part of when we participate in the dialectic relations of meaning and numbering that currently compose vague holes, the collectives, the individuals in and by which we live. So, that is the end of the talk. Thank you so much. I think we'll give you a Hello. context for you. Um, Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Th
that comes with that. But then he's also interested in how that becomes or might contribute to um, psychological conditions such as schizophrenia. So he's very aware of the, the potential sort of psychological uh, difficulties that can emerge in transcontextualism. However, another example would be the double take. So you've got double bind and double take. Uh, and with the double take, you you do t you get the point. You take it again, and you play with the fact that whatever it is means something rather different in a different context. So that you do open. He, and he is also aware of these ludic possibilities of the double take, um, and would suggest that it is a source those kinds of issues are a source of great humour. They're, they're, they're kind of the springs of humour, almost, is, is the double take. Um, and he also considers how um, th this, this kind of like not understanding the context or coming to learn about differences in context is a, a real trigger for learning as well. So he's kind of what can be transferred across contexts, what can be learnt as what travels across contexts. So I think in Bateson's notion of transcontextualism, you both have the ways in which it can produce this kind of intensification of difference which can... Um, which can't be resolved, that, and, and it will intensify, and it will intensify, and obviously that can be part of the dynamics of, in social media. But he is also aware of this, the double take, and the ludic possibilities, and others. So I think, to, for me, this really, really is a really nice example um, that will mean that I have to pay more attention to those ludic possibilities. But it also maybe indicates how it is, well, maybe like a lot of humour, it's quite dangerous humour as well. Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was also thinking of the uh, the Queen's uh, w use of the word "one," which becomes a ludic thing, as, and also the royal "we" as well. But anyway, there's uh, other examples to. No, no, I thought of that one. I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Or and what would it mean to say people like one <laughs> instead of anyway instead yeah. of people like you? All right. Thanks very much, Celia. Hi again, Celia, and uh, Hi. just to, to uh, echo others, again, thank you for this really rich and stimulating talk. Um, and I really enjoyed your elaboration of the individual as a particular combination of singular and plural. Uh, but it, in listening to the talk, I was thinking about its historical specificity and how it might contrast from other forms of collective subjects, indeed even those that are mediated through pronomial reference. Uh, so I was thinking specifically, uh, and this was mentioned in a couple of talks yesterday, the we the people of the uh, United States Constitution, which of course is invoking a collective subject performatively. We the people, uh, and making a gesture to popular sovereignty, which of course then historically ends up being elaborated through a political structure and political institutions that are performed and reperformed in elections and in other uh, types of political context. Um, and in thinking of your examples, it seemed to me that the not in my name movement in, in many ways is mediated by that kind of notion of, uh, of popular sovereignty, yeah, or yeah. A, a we the people, in contrast to the uh, uh, je suis Charlie or, or me too. Um, so I was then trying to think about what makes the, the, the type of collective subject or individual subject of those latter two uh, uh, movements uh, unique and historically specific. And it seems part of your argument is that they're mediated by different types of institutions and technologies. Here, social media being important uh, in, in the way in which there could be a mass but individuated performance of, of those hashtags. Uh, um, that yes, me too, uh, uh, I am, um, in, in a way that's, that's qualitatively, uh, technologically and institutionally different from the, the we the people are voting uh, or sort of a, a mass gathering, a mass demonstration uh, uh, before some site of power, uh, the mall in Washington, but you could find equivalents in, in other uh, uh, democratic contexts. And so in trying to think about those historical specificities, uh, uh, I was wondering, um, how you you see the 
the uniqueness or the, the specificity of the, the individual collective subject as perhaps translating into a, a different sort of political subject. Uh, and so when you ended the talk uh, mentioning this sort of, uh, you created this image of being stuck in the middle together, I was kind of wondering what are the, what does that look like politically, uh, the politics of being stuck in the middle? <laughs> Oh, yes, that's, well, thank you very much for that question. Um, I, I think one of the things to, to point out is that I'm uh, using that notion of Condivigil from Desiris, whose book um, focuses on the improper, uh, improper names, and he gives a series of very rich case studies from different historical periods. Um, and uh, provides a, a powerful analysis of um, kind of the, the political agency of improper meanings, meanings and the kinds of individuals that emerge there. I was using it to look, precisely you say it, this, um, the, the ways in which the singular and the plural are always co-constituted. So, the, in, in English, the people like you can, you can be you, you or it can be you, everybody in the room. And But also, um, like, how is the singular and the plural done simultaneously? Mm. So, in my first example, uh, not in our name, as the name of an organization to which individuals belong by uh, attaching their signature, they are um, it, they are constituted as individuals who will persist independently of the collective entity that they join. Uh, they join voluntarily, they join by um, showing a mark of themselves, the signature. And in some sense, their association is entirely formal, is not substantive uh, in some kind of a way. Um, and the organization has a beginning and an end, uh, and is recognized with uh, specific legal practices. Then the, my, my second example, with Je suis Charlie, um, I think what's interesting for me there is obviously, as I say, that proper name doesn't work in the same way, and there are all these contests. Um, but the, some of those contests are in part about the way in which uh, the phrase Je suis Charlie, was that adopted as a kind of French universalism of, you know, we are all Charlie, in fact, which would be this kind of universalization of the phrase. And then, but there was contestation of that with the je ne suis pas Charlie, um, no, you know, and I oppose violence. You know, I, there is more than one way to oppose violence, and it's not by identifying with the universal independent subject. And then there were criticisms of what was perceived as the Anglo-Saxon take on the French <laughs> universalism. And, and you can see it splinters, it forks, it goes in many directions. But what emerges from Je suis Charlie is not a, a, a collective of independent individuals. It is something where the dividing with the conjoining is done differently. And then again with Me Too, similarly. Um, and I guess what I was trying to do with the example around Me Too is, um, and the discussion of questions of truth, is this, it is, those questions of epistemology of truth are for me also political questions. Whose voice will be heard? Whose voice will be trusted? Um, who, who, who speaks and who is heard? Those are the fundamental questions and I was trying to think through kind of um, what kinds of belonging are involved in movements like Me Too, what does it mean to say Me Too, uh, and what are the political possibilities and I think it's a nice example because it is one which is being is not staying in social media. It is one where, you know, it, if you say me too and you name somebody specifically, 
then those accusations have had real effects, rightly or wrongly. <laughs> um, and what I was trying to point to is that, um, you know, that there are these uh, fault lines of we can participate in without being part of. Um, and the nature of our participation is still, I, in a way, it's almost that I don't want to say this then is about proper and improper as if they can be divided. By drawing on the, the Mackenzie, uh, where, uh, you know, a sphere of um, life in which questions of truth of probability are seen as scientific, uh, that nevertheless to say that everything is only a distributed uh, probability is providing an alternative notion of truth. Well, can we work, what, you know, can, can we work with that or to what extent do we want to challenge the location of truth in independent individuals? Are there other ways? Could there be other ways? What kind of politics would that be that didn't lead to um, you know, consequences that we would not want to live with? So I, 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 what I was hoping across the examples was precisely to see some of those uh, changes in terms of the credibility, the authority of individuals, but also to recognize with the the language fractions that the boundaries, the borders of inside and outside, inclusion and exclusion, inclusive exclusion, exclusive inclusion, they're fuzzy, they're ragged, and we don't know how to live in them. I think it's just being explored in a whole range of different locations. And I don't feel able to sort of say this is the way forward, but I think we have to take explore them and take them seriously and see what's being done. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Hello, um, it's Ava Hello. I, I think we met a couple of decades ago. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm yes. a little bit hesitant to ask my question because it's sort of asking you to go beyond what you were talking about. But as you were, as you were speaking, I was thinking about the politics in the street and um, a phrase that came into my mind was something that Eva Lutakali, a Finnish political sociologist, had uh, written about in the Finnish newspapers, where she points out, or she made, I think the headline, probably from a sub editor, was that while the French riot in the streets, Finns riot online. Um, and it's kind of, and it kind of made me think about the, well, two things. One is you were talking, I think, quite, I thought metaphorically, about inclusion as a spatial thing, so that somehow the middle is a kind of spatial um, space that can't be shared uh, in, in a kind of conceptual sense, although of course in the contextual everyday practice of it, it is and it, got, it gets um, shifted around. But also in, in sort of sense of, can we say something empirically about how these kinds of processes play out in different political cultures? Because the, the Finnish example that I gave, the, the Finns versus the French, uh, in a sense, we're talking about particular fo forms of violence that are being enacted, but in, in different ways, and both involve social media and both involve being on the streets with placards, with bodies, um, and also in that kind of sense of being more than one, as, be, as in being in a demonstration where you kind of lose yourself physically as an individual and you become part of the the bigger body, if only temporarily. So I'm sort of asking you if there are empirically any places that you could think of to go with the, the kind of more linguistic an analysis that you gave, if that makes mm -hmm. any sense. Yeah, that, that too is extremely interesting as a question. Um, I do think, um, to, I did try to talk about the space of the demonstration. I do think it's a very, very interesting one. Um, and I think your introduction of the body <laughs> into the discussion of the demonstration is also very helpful. 
I mean, I reference Willem in some sense having, denying, saying he doesn't want anyone else having any kind of existential link to the event. Um, well, one presumes because, you know, the nature of experiencing the attack is not one that he thinks that can be, you can't just say, I share that. Um, but in a, in a demonstration, I, I sort of mentioned the importance of co presence or the ability to point everybody to be able to point someone else out, as it were. Um, and I think that maybe is goes some of the way to try to address what you were talking about, the ways in which, yes, you are a one, but you are part of something bigger too. Um, and that is simply just done through a kind of co-presence, a visibility to each other, but not just a visibility to each other. In some sense, it's sort of the, the shared existential um, co-location, as it were, which means that you, you do share the same uh, threat of violence um, or, or, or whatever, and that that does give... Uh, a different uh, r register to to what is going on in a demonstration, um, and I think I'm trying to indicate in a half phrase uh, that that kind of like that it might be useful to try and think about what happens, you know, like what happens when a demonstration assembly becomes proud. Uh, what is is there a loss of um, transformation in the kind of the relation between the singular and the plural. Um, and I feel I'm quite addressing what you're asking me to. Um, I think, and I, to be honest, I'm not, I was with you, and then right at the end you said, how could I develop that in linguistic terms? And I had thought that the rest of your question was much like don't just do this linguistically yeah. no, <laughs> do it into yeah I mean, I, I, I'm inspired perhaps by the writing of somebody like Stina Kroya, who writes about figuration. And it's almost uh, her analysis of street demonstrations is almost completely lacking in any linguistic element at all. And I suppose I'm always okay. invested in social movements as being very much about language and about conceptualizing and about being able to communicate mid Thailand or whatever have you. And I've been quite you know, enthused by this, the body that acts yeah. as one. And then I was thinking, you know, that there could be an interesting way of bringing those two together, but I can't see how you could do it. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I can't see how I can do it now, but I will think on it because I yes. think it's really important. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Anna Gershon. I'm an anthropologist, and I think that might be shaping some of my question. As, as you were speaking, it really occurred to me that you're talking about the kind of speaking subject that might be in Michael Warner's public, and that, that and, and what, and as I was thinking through that, I was realizing one of the things that anthropologists have done in response to thinking about Michael Warner's notion of the public is to claim that he has a very particular historically specific media ecology in the back of his mind as he is working this out. And so it occurred to me to ask you, is there something specific about this media ecology that is shaping the kind of con visual that you are thinking about? Is there a kind of historical specificity for this particular version of the con visual? Is, is this a work that you are doing as well? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think that's really helpful. Um, and I guess the there's some implicit way in which I was doing that insofar as, you know, my example, yeah. uh, a location yet in the US, then there's Sri Charlie, which obviously was a sort of global phenomenon in some ways, but led to an incident in France. Um, and then Me Too, once again, starting in the US, but uh, kind of more widespread and taken up in, in very different ways in different locations, which I didn't begin to explore there. Um, but the more general point, I think, is about 
and it goes back to Andy's point about how do we do politics? Do we do politics as we the people, uh, we, uh, uh, you know, individuals who are constituted as individuals in relation to the state who give us our name or, or give us legitimacy to be an individual with their apparatus of naming? Or, and what happens you know, what is the political credibility, what is the political authority of people of me too? You know, is that, that seems to me what is live now and that that is a, something that does emerge from the specific media ecology of social media. And that's what I was trying to, to point to here that, um, that there is a different kind of politics of naming, there's a different politics of numbering, um, and there's a different politics of truth that, that, that is there, and kind of whether and how the, the Me Too, the singular and plural individual that is constituted there, what kind of political agency they can have is, is an open question at the moment uh, yeah so it, it it is you could locate the history I gave or the, the examples I gave in relation to Habermas and the public sphere and then Warner and, uh, and so on and I think yeah it's a link it's a, it, I would acknowledge there is that link there but it, uh, what I was trying to do was pay in that final discussion of mediation to say we it is we do need to look at the specificity of that process of mediation. We do need to look at the media ecology because it is if you you know it is just going straight back to the the Benvenise, you know the the, the self referencing and the referencing of the language of the media they they they're done together and and we need to think about language as language, but also as numbering, but also as social media. We, we just need to do those things. Okay, thank you. Does that help or not? Yes, it does, very much. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you so much for your questions. Very, very helpful. And once again, apologies for not being there. Uh,